1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, let, actually, let's look back at chapter 5. There is um, a bit in chapter 5 I want to highlight. Then we'll look at uh, Galatians 5 as well. But this, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Let's just stop there. I love how the King James language puts it. It just is the use that I chose for the message title. No surprise. But uh, the King James says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So the title of the message, A Little Leaven. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And of course, uh, the NIV makes it very clear as to what that means, which is that yeast works its way through the whole batch of dough. And it doesn't take a whole lot of yeast to have that whole process take place. But it's interesting because the teaching we have here actually comes up also in the book of Galatians. Flip over Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and this verse as well highlights this particular bit. Galatians chapter 5, and beginning to read in verse 8. A little, or sorry, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now, it's interesting because in Corinthians we get a little bit more clarity as to what Paul is talking about with this analogy. So looking back at the other passage that you've just turned away from. I want to read this. Your boasting isn't good. Don't you know the little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? And then he says in verse 7, get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without <coughs> yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Let's go to the Lord before we continue. Father, we need your wisdom. This morning I pray that you would just help us understand the teaching that is being put forth here. Help us to be able to have clarity of thought and mind as we look at it, that we might know what it is that you have to say to us and that we might not miss it. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to having a little bit of leaven, leavening the whole lump, or a little bit of yeast which works its way through the whole batch of dough, we actually have a teaching which, if stretched, and you can just almost imagine dough being stretched, can't you? It actually has many different applications because I believe Paul was using something very common to the people to help them understand something about life. Paul, like Jesus took illustrations of things which were around the people to help them understand a little bit more about what their life consisted of and what was important, and in this case, what might be dangerous and what might damage a lot of good. If I were to have this morning as an illustration a large punch bowl up here, many of you would drool over the opportunity to maybe get a little punch. And if I showed you all of the lovely fruit mixture that I put into it and it had that lovely berry red color, and you know how we love punch with bits. Do you know how it is? When it's got bits, you know it's really got fruit. It's not something made from powder. So it's got bits and it looks lovely and it's great. And I have a, quite a large punch bowl. So there'd be opportunity for everybody to have some punch because it's a large punch bowl. But then I just pull out a small little bitty vial about that small. You know how those little samples of perfume you get at Harrods? What do you mean? Yeah. I, okay. So... 
No. <laughs> Not that I've ever had one, but I've heard of people. Have. No, the little bitty vials of perfume that you get. So I pull out one of those little things, and I open it up, and I say, this, however, is strychnine poison, and I'm just going to put this small vial into, and I put it into the punch bowl, and I just stir it around, and I say, there you go. Who's first? Who would like a little bit of the punch? And suddenly nobody responds. Well, why wouldn't they respond? There's this huge, great big punch bowl of lovely fruit. You've seen the ingredients. Why would you not want to respond? Well, because what you put in it, though it was small, once mixed in with the rest, pollutes the whole bunch. Suddenly now none of that punch is any good because of that little bitty vial of poison. You see the illustration. When we talk about leaven, we can stretch this to actually mean the things which are poisonous to us in life. Which, if inserted in an entire punch bowl life full of good ingredients, can actually taint or destroy, make valueless, make worthless everything that we have put in which was good. When you don't want leaven, it means that you care. When we look at our lives, I think that we have a tendency to see important parts of them and realize that we would like to build a life full of good works. We would like to do things within our lives which produce good fruit, which help us become better people, which help us get closer to God, which help us become better Christians. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to do good things with our lives. We get an education. And if we don't get an education, we get apprenticed or trained so that we can learn how to do something which will be valuable, which will, if not be valuable for mankind, at least be valuable for us to help us make a living so that we can continue to live. And so we look at bettering ourselves. Some of us, maybe I should say some of you, spend good time exercising. You know, doing some things to help your physical body. And you say, oh, I don't do a whole lot of exercise. Well, does that mean you sit in a chair all day and never move? Oh, well, no, I don't do that. Do you get up on occasion and do you walk around? And why do you do that? Well, because it helps my bones stretch. It gets my circulation going. I know it's good. In our home, we have this phrase we use often, which is you need a little fresh air and exercise. You know, you need to get outside. You need to open the windows. You need to breathe some fresh air. You need to get out and do something because that's healthy for you. That's good for you. Hang on a minute. Let's just ask yourselves the question. But why? Well, because we care. See? We want you to be healthy. We want to live happy, healthy lives. And so we feed ourselves. I don't mean food. I mean we give ourselves opportunity to do things which are going to help us get better. Sometimes you get a new um, piece of technology. I know some of you for Christmas may have gotten a new piece of technology. Maybe you got an iPad or a new phone or something like that that you'd say, oh, I got another new little gadget, or as we will say, toys. You know, I got a new toy, something else to play with, and I can, I can mess around with it. But then after we get that new toy, we want to spend a little bit of time learning how to use it. And so we look up online or we might open a book. Do you remember when you used to get manuals with things? <laughs> you know, no, they give you a link now. Follow this, download this, you know, if you're really crazy, print it out. Otherwise, just read it. But we look to read a little bit more information about the apparatus or the programs that we get so that we can learn how to get better at it, learn all the different things that it does. And so we do that because we'd like to get more skilled. We'd like to learn how to do it better. And even the younger generations, you say, oh yeah, but I'm not that kind. I'm not the, 
I'm not interested in becoming, you know, better at using Microsoft Office and all that. Okay, well, forget all of that because there are also video game opportunities, you know. And, and you'll see young people learning how to get more points, get more lives, get more of this and more. And they study the different tricks of how in these video games to be able to, to get more and conquer more and, and, and grow and get to the top of the leader's table of their video game. And it all, it all is trying to get to the betterment of stuff. You know? But within everything I just gave you an illustration of, there are times when there are small vials of poison sitting there which can ruin all of it. Within technology, we call them viruses, don't we? There's nothing worse, nothing worse. Downloading a virus. And they have one thing that you may have heard the term, even if you don't understand it. Those of us who played around with computers dread the word, which is called Trojan horse. Oh, yeah. When it downloads something small and becomes very big because it enters into every different aspect of the program. And just when you think you've killed it here, it's still there. And you kill it there and it's still, and you can't, it's difficult, nigh impossible to get rid of everything because you just really need to strip it all down to start over when that happens. This is a little leaven, see, which leavens the whole lump. It ruins everything. So then we can also review our lives in that way, can't we? We can look at the things within our moral characters and say, you know, I actually do a whole lot of good things. In fact, I've had people say to me, John, you know, you talk a lot about breaking the speed limit. It makes me feel really guilty. And I've been doing really well at trying to keep the speed limit. And I smile. I think that's great to hear, you know. You get people who are working really hard at trying to do better, trying to better themselves <laughs> and become better. But then there are other areas of life where only a small vial of poison can ruin everything, can destroy everything, because you decide to get involved in something which actually will pollute absolutely every area of your life. The small vial of poison which we let enter in. And suddenly, speeding seems to be just so, you know, small compared to everything else that you've got involved in. When you don't want leaven, it means you care. It means you don't want to have everything ruined. And so you're very careful not to allow that small vial of poison to get into your life. Second point I want to bring out is sometimes a little is too much. I think we live on the principle that says, you know, we, we as Christian people, but certainly as human beings, we try to live in moderation. All of us do. Even people who aren't Christians know that if you take too much of something, that's not good. So, you know, be it alcohol, for instance. There are those who say, I can dabble with a little bit of alcohol, but too much alcohol isn't good. And too much alcohol for too long can be really bad and detrimental. And then some people will say, well, actually, medication can be very good. And uh, many of you have uh, had very strong medicines taken, which you needed to be able to alleviate certain pains. But if you take that medicine in a too high of a dose, it can kill you. If you take that medicine over too long a period of time, it can addict you can make you so that you're dependent upon it. And that's also not good. So we have within our character, and I just mentioned those as some illustrations, you could throw in a lot more. We have within our character the knowledge that says a little is okay. We have to be careful because a, a little is okay. In fact, you can almost do a little of anything and get away with it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, a little bit of everything is, is kind of okay. But sometimes, and this was my point, sometimes a little is too much. You see, sometimes a person would say to themselves, you know, I pay 
for almost all of my groceries all of the time. I really do. I'm very good. Unlike many I know who sneak in items on the till, I'm not like that. I pay for everything. But then there are occasions where I realize that I'm a bit short on cash and I need that extra ingredient and I can get away with putting it in the bag without paying for it. And I, and, and I don't do that very often. I do it very rarely. In fact, I can say that over a period of a year, I've only done it maybe once or twice at the most. Sometimes even a little is too much. Because anything like that is wrong. And we need to be aware of the fact that our <coughs> character could be completely destroyed by that small thing. It's interesting because I was going through one of the grocery stores. I went to Hottiston. I think they don't do it in Chess anymore, but I was in Hottiston and I was looking at all those reduced item things. Do you ever do that? Do you ever watch the clock and know when, you know, when they're going to put the fried chicken out and put it on discount? <laughs> Woo! I'm there, you know. And you make a beeline for where it's going to be and, you know, there's a few things sitting out and you look at them and you grab it, put it in a trolley, head up to the front. And I noticed that as I was checking out, and of course, when I got there, I realized, oh, didn't bring any bags. You know how it happened. Yeah. So here I am, and I'm, and I'm running through the till. And I looked over. Just I don't even know why. I would just, just by nature, I looked over to, to see if there was anybody around. And I noticed that there was only one person on the till, and he was extremely busy. So there was absolutely nobody watching. And then, of course, the thing pops up. Do you want a bag? And I said, yes. And I clicked. You know, I only needed one. I was going to shove it all in. I was going to make this work. I was going to pay 10p for what I needed, you know. And I made it all work with 5p. And I put it all in the bag. And, uh, and I got it in. And, of course, you know, as I was walking out. But I did notice it. But then just as I was leaving, I noticed that another person behind who actually worked there that I hadn't seen walked up, and it crossed my mind, ah, they might have been checking to see if I actually paid for that bag. And I thought, what if I hadn't? It, no, it didn't cross my mind. I'm being honest with you. I, I would pay for my bags. It's, not, it's only 5p, and it doesn't make any difference to me, and I believe we should do that. But I thought to myself, that could have ruined everything I just did, paid for everything. But if I hadn't paid that 5p for that bag, if I decided that looking over and noticing how busy the man was, if that action had been me checking to see if anybody was watching me, I could have had everything ruined. Now, would they have stopped me on the way out the door? Probably not. They probably just would have shaken their head, rolled their eyes, and that would have been it. But a testimony could be ruined really quickly by stealing a 5p bag. You say to yourself, wait a minute, come on, 5P, you know. I mean, I was walking into church this morning, and I found 5P on the ground. Woo, I forgot to, i got to remember to put that in the little thing back there. But, um, you know, it takes 5P, come on. If you looked at how many other items I purchased and you tallied that up, it came to a sizable figure. In fact, Bethany and I had a chat about it when I got home, how I really shouldn't have bought as much as I did. You know, So I spent a little bit of money on these things that I bought, but I thought to myself, I could have just saved myself 5p by nicking a bag. And nobody was watching. Do you see what I mean? Do you see the temptation? And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm trying to say, sometimes a little is too much. We try. We say, it's just a little. It really doesn't make any difference. It's not going to be noticed. You get to the till. You're scanning things at the self-service. You're listening to the beeps. And suddenly one of them doesn't beep. Do I put it down or do I try it again? So I try it again, it still doesn't beat. I look around and they're busy. What do I do? Have opportunity, see? Might be able to get away with it. But do I just, do I wait? To call them over to say, please, will you, will you do this? Will you help me? Because I don't, I want to pay for it all. I want to make this good because it matters because I don't, want a small vial 
put into my lovely big fruit punch bowl. Because sometimes that's going to ruin the whole thing. <laughs> I'm, on the Tesco illustration, it was great. You remember when I celebrated my dad's 100th birthday and I went shopping and I bought all these things that were only going to be used for a birthday party for somebody who wasn't even going to appreciate it. And, uh, you know, and so I was buying all these things. And I decided that I would do what my wife does all the time and I'd get one of those you know, uh, scanner so I could do it all myself. And, uh, I, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, pretty much fun, but especially because they try to make that really good. See, in Tesco's, they put nice wood floors. Do you ever notice they, they try to make that, that checkout much more posh than the other ones, and so they want to encourage you to do it. And I did it, and I did it. But there were a few times, seriously, that I would I'd put it in, in the trolley and walk around, and they'd go, oh, I forgot to scan it because I'm not used to that, and have to get it back out and make sure I got everything and go through the till. And I did that twice or three times. So then when I came to it and I scanned it through and did all my little bits, and, and, uh, and you know, here it comes, and it did that. What often happens to, to you, it says, you've been randomly chosen. Oh, no! <laughs> you know? To have have all this stuff check out, and I, now I'm panicking, going, "Oh, I hope I didn't screw this up." You know, guess who walks over to me, Marsha? <laughs> oh no! And uh, and so here's a lady from our church who comes over, and I'm thinking, "Oh, this could have been really catastrophic," you know. <laughs> But uh, she comes over and she's checking it all out and we're chatting. And she, But she did her job, which I was really pleased that she did. She didn't just look and say, oh, it was him, let him, you know, and, and check maybe one or two. She scanned through four items. I thought, she, you know, and she just kept going. But we were visiting, so I could tell she was enjoying the opportunity as well. And thankfully, I paid for everything and I was okay. But there again, here's another opportunity. What if, what if a little leaven could have messed up an entire testimony? Now, now just think, put yourself in my position. How many sermons have I preached in almost 10 years? That's a loads of them, you know. What if I hadn't paid for something at the grocery till? A person could look and say, you know what? 10 years worth of ministry could just be shot because of one thing. You see how important it is. The pressure's on. I mean, goodness me, the pressure's on me worse than it is you. But we all have that testimony before God. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We need to be careful. And sometimes a little is too much. The third point is this. Once leavened, it can't be unleavened. I didn't check my grammar. I didn't check my... Sometimes when you're a preacher, you get away with saying words that don't exist, you know. So I don't know if that one exists or not, but you know what I mean. Once it's been leavened, it can't be unleavened. There was a preacher, it was a Methodist evangelist from um, North, uh, South Carolina, who once used to have this phrase, and it was powerful. I knew I had heard that he had said this, and so I had him quoted. But now that we've got the internet, I went back on it to make sure if he was really the first person that ever said it, or if it was Abraham Lincoln or somebody else, you know, long before him. But it was him. It was a man by the name of Dr. Bob Jones Sr. And he used to say this, don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. Don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. You have this opportunity. Things are going quickly. You can actually get away with something. You can do something that won't be seen. You can take something. You can commit some act that won't be seen. You can do something small and probably be able to get away with it. But if you don't, what you've done that you consider immediate could ruin the permanent of who you are and what you are as a character. Suddenly every prayer you've ever prayed, every sermon you've ever preached, every good bit of advice that you've ever given is completely ruined because of some small little thing that comes up immediately you have an opportunity to commit. 
it's an incredibly powerful lesson to learn that only a small bit of poison can kill you. You look at the size of a person's body. You look at how little it takes to destroy a person's body. I remember when I was uh, in sport, and uh, it was quite frequent that different parts of your body would become injured when you were in sport. And American football certainly was one of those sports where you could easily become injured um, by because it was such a contact sport. But I'll never forget, when you have these tough linemen, it's worse now than it used to be when I was in <coughs> sport, but you'd have the linemen, which are the men who are right up on the front, they're the ones who make this initial contact, and they're big. And they don't have to be tremendously athletic. I mean, they just have to be big, you know. So it's almost like being hit by a, a, a wall, you know, or a freight train or whatever, you know, whatever you want to have. In fact, some of them develop names, and I've told you this before. American footballers would develop names, nicknames, and one of them was called the refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but then a guy comes on the team who's bigger than him, so they nicknamed him the kitchen. <laughs> you know, they just kept getting bigger. And it was just, and it's great, because that, that, but that's very much what it's like, you know. So they don't have to be tremendously athletic, but they do have to be big. But what I found really humorous was when I'd get on a team with some of these guys, and they're enormous in size. And I mean, it would be dreadful to have them fall on you. It'd be like being run over by a car, you know. And uh, so you've got these guys. And then they'd stub their toe and not be able to play. Oh. You know? And you'd say, what? <laughs> yeah, well, I was actually, you know, I got up in the night and I was going to the loo and I hit the bed just as... And I stubbed my toe, and I can't walk. I can't play. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? You look at the size of a person's toe compared to the rest of the size of that person's body. But some of you know that have had it, those little, little members of your body injured, and you know what kind of damage it can do to the rest of you how dependent we are upon those little things. And it helps you realize just how important little things are to the big scope of things. And when it comes to our lives, it's no different. The small little injuries, the small little sins that we can commit, we think we can get away with, we think are insignificant, especially when you consider the size of the rest. In the Old Testament, there is an illustration about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, and there was the vision that he had, and Daniel interpreted, and how that you had the, I can't remember the whole thing, but there was an image, and it, it had all of these bits to it which were powerful and strong, like brass and iron and gold and, and wood. And they had all of these powerful, strong elements in it, but, the, but then at the end, it had feet, of clay. You say, well, hang on a minute. If I've got an incredibly powerful and strong image that, you know, says power, but I have feet of clay. If, if all the foundation of which that image is standing is on something as brittle and frail and <laughs> fragile as clay, then actually, what does it do to the rest? It just, it has it all kind of put in perspective. You know, it, does, it just isn't all that big. We have the biblical teaching as well. And I mentioned, um, you know, the, the foundation that talks about building your house upon a rock rather than building it on shifting sand. I've given this illustration before, but when I went out to visit California, you know where the celebrities live. And uh, it's interesting. There's an area just outside of Los Angeles as you're heading towards the beach and, of course, for every kilometer that you drive, the house prices go up, you know, as you're getting closer to the water. And by the time you get down really close to the water, they become silly money, you know. And then, because some of the people who owned that property had quite a sizable house on it, you know, then they decided to tear that down and build something they could divide and make it so that the house wasn't all that wide, but it was tall, so they could sell it and everybody would have beach front views and they could get millions and millions out of these houses 
But it was interesting because as my friend that I used to have as a work colleague who moved to that area, worked in that area, was taking me, we're driving out. He's telling me what I'm telling you about how the prices are going up. We had a red light at one stage, and I could see the water down probably half a mile, maybe maybe a bit more from us. So we were heading towards the beach. And I, we got to a red light, and I looked out, and they were doing some road works at the, you know, we had to move over lanes. And I noticed they'd tore the, torn the road up. Do you know what was underneath the road? Sand. And I looked down, I saw that, and I thought to myself, hang on a minute. You know, I see all of this stuff built up and of course there were loads of houses from here all the way to the beach but are we really built right on top of sand and i said to him i said now they haven't <laughs> dug down very far and, and you know the road's torn up but i see that sand he said oh yeah he said right back at about and he told me about you know little behind us it it turns to sand from here on out so all of this has been built right on top of the sand and then he says this in excited words. He said, do you know what's really fascinating? He said, we're on an earthquake fault here. <laughs> and he says to me as we're, as we're driving, he said, do you know what happens to sand when it's shaken? You know, when you start shaking sand like happens in an earthquake, if we had a major earthquake, he said, it's just like water. And he said, so virtually everything that you see right here, if we had a major earthquake, would just sink into the ground. I started thinking, and they paid millions for these homes built upon sinking sand. And the first thought that came to my mind, I said to him, he was a Christian, I said, they should have gone to Sunday school, you know, because <laughs> I learned a song when I was really little that told me that I shouldn't do this, you know. The wise man built his house upon the rock, you know. And I thought, this is just stupid, really silly. But this is, the, this is what people do. This is what life, ha what people do. This is how we end up messing stuff up. And this is the same principle. Something little, something small can mean a whole lot. We can sign contracts, if we're not careful, with small print that get us stuck into a situation that later we regret. And it's not the big print, it's the small print. It's the stuff that suddenly, you know, we, it all looks so good until we read the small print and then realize that actually this isn't good. You say, oh, but there's so much big print in the contract that's so good. Yeah, but what little, the little print can ruin the whole contract. Make the whole thing just come tumbling down. Don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. We have a lot of lessons in one verse. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The illustrations that Jesus and in this case, Paul gives to us our lessons that if we take them on board, they'll be to our benefit. They'll be to our good. But when Satan comes along and tempts you with something small, be careful. Be careful that you don't sacrifice everything in the punch bowl for something he says won't matter because it's only little. Let's pray.